Welcome to Monday Morning Coffee with Inside the Firm. Each week, our hosts will be interviewing local, regional, and national business leaders to give you an inside peek into how they lead their business to success in the ever-competitive business climate. Welcome to Monday Morning Coffee Inside the Firm. Today, I have a very special guest. Dr. Michael Jayquith is a PhD chemist who left the corporate world and now helps men everywhere discover how to get more of what they want and live the promise of an abundant life. By combining analytical science, psychology, and the time-honored teachings of the faith, Michael helps men who feel stuck, confused, and powerless to unlock those chains and find out what they really want. Michael is married with six children and lives in rural northern Idaho. Michael, welcome to the show. Lance, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, yeah. Idaho is fantastic. I spent a lot of time up there, so I'm kind of jealous that uh, you're up there crushing it with that big family. That's fantastic. Um, before we get into what you do exactly for men, you know, tell tell us how you got here. Are you fam- are you from a, a family of entrepreneurs? Where does that spirit come from? You know, the, the short answer there is how I got here is the good Lord hit me upside the head with a two by four enough times. Uh, my original family was pretty broken. Um, they were kind of pretty blue collar and not that good at that even. And so I left home and I decided I want a different life. I a couple of people advised that as you work through graduate school, it did that and then found out that the corporate life is kind of a little bumpy and then got called over here to become the entrepreneur. Really, my wife helped a ton with that. She's very entrepreneurial. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, to, to go for school for that long to get a PhD, I imagine you went for what, seven years? Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of people just get stuck in the, in the academic world. So how did you get pulled out of that? Well, so I graduated in 2008, and those who remember, like, that was not a great time for an economy. And my boss said to me, here's the deal. You can either work without pay or go get a job. And I said, ooh, working without pay sucks. And so I looked around at who's hiring, right? And I have all these great first-round interviews end of 2007. Then 2008 starts, and every company's like, sorry, we have a hiring freeze. And my boss like, your money runs out in February. Intel said, we're hiring. I said, I'm working for Intel. It was really that simple. Like, sometimes you only have one door. Yeah, that's true. I, we must be the, almost the exact same age then, and because uh, my story is much, much like yours. Graduated 2008, everything took a crap, and you just had to take what you can get. And then it kind of led both of us here. And now we're talking today. Um, let's get into how you help men. Some of the things you you help them with. I, I think one of the things that men. I'm, I'm, now I'm going to try to speak for all of us here, but like I know for me, having control of my day to day is very important. Uh, I sort of feel like I'm floating if I'm not, and it just makes puts me in a very uncomfortable anxiety-like state. Uh, state. And men are natural leaders too, right? Uh, for for millennia, Absolutely. we we have been just natural leaders. That's part of the deal. Um, so how how do you help men get more control in their lives? I think the first thing we have to do when you talk about the dirty word I call control is you have to understand what exactly we are controlling. You know, there's a lot of great books out there, David Goggins, you know, others like him that talk about this radical ownership. And they say, oh, if the results aren't great, it's your fault. And actually, I believe that's true. However, what most men miss is where the control actually takes place. We all think we can control the outcome. We can't. All we ever do is we control how we show up. And that sounds so simple. But when you really dive into that, there's a process of surrendering the outcome to God, to a higher power, whatever you believe. But if once you surrender that outcome and realize you can't control that outcome, and that on top of that, the world will yell at you for not, that doesn't make me the world's right. But then you look and say, well, what can I control? Well, I get up in the morning. What do I do? Do I tie my shoes? You get break it down to basic, simple premises for every single problem we look at. What can I control? Where do I have agency? Yeah, yeah, it starts exactly. I think it starts very intentionally each morning. Do you have a morning routine um, for yourself and that you try to help coach people with in, in order to start the day off right? I think that's where it is. Absolutely. And, and first off, everyone has to make their own morning routine. Like I think a lot of people they hear, oh, this is this one morning routine. I'll try it. Be an experimentalist. I'm a scientist at heart. And what you got to do is you got to be willing to say, I'm going to try this for a few days. Did it work? Okay, great. Let's change it. For me, here's what works. I get up. The first thing I do is I go to prayer. I spend at least 10 minutes in prayer. Look, I got six kids. I don't always sleep well. Sometimes, you know, you're dragging a little bit, get out of bed, but I make sure I get at least 10 minutes of prayer. When my kids get older, I like to make it an hour. It's not, I'm not there right now, 10 minutes. Then I get up, I go to the gym. And I'm a, I'm a very high type A personality. And I've learned about myself. If I don't work out first thing in the morning, I am a jerk face, like straight up unadulterated. No one wants to be around me. But if I can get that energy put out somewhere constructive, I'm a lot better person. Then I come home, I cook breakfast. I spend a little time with my kids um, and then I'm right off to work. Yeah. Was there, how did you get to that routine? Um, you know, was it a, a trial and error and everything, but that, is there examples of, of where maybe some things that you cut out of your morning routine that don't exist there anymore? So I used to have, a, I tried to at one point in time to do a longer prayer time. 
And I just found that didn't work with having as many kids. And as, as early as I was trying to get up, I was just too tired. I was just dragging. You know, it's a funny story. I used to have, at that stage of my life, I had this fight with my wife because she wanted to stay up later and I wanted to go to bed earlier because I was getting up so stinking early. Mm -hmm. Well, what I realized was she actually just wanted time with me without kids. And it wasn't actually a fight over how much sleep we were getting. And so I realized, okay, I'll just take a nap for this phase of life. And then I could stay up later with my wife, have that time with her without children and still be able to get up at a, what I thought was a semi-reasonable early hour to get my day going. And, and it comes and it goes. Like I remember for a while, I said, I'll just cut out the gym. I can go to the gym later in the day. Mm -hmm. I think that lasted a week before my wife said, you're going back to the gym in the morning. I don't want to deal with you. <laughs> what a good sounding board you have. Uh, that's really great. Um, if, if a lot of men, you know, struggle with things long-term. And I think a lot of it comes from, from trauma in childhood that is just never really addressed. How do you help coach men through? And just, this is a, it's a, been a theme in my life in for the past two years, I think this word trauma coming up and just like understanding it, a 40, 41 year old male, that there is a lot of people and the problems that people pro are projecting, you know, where they seem like they have a problem. It's, it's from this inner trauma that maybe they've just never addressed. How do you work with, with men to just get that out there and, and start addressing that stuff? So the word trauma is a lot is pretty overused in our society today. And look, there's room for it. Is let's say you were abused sexually as a child, that's capital T trauma. We need to go to the therapist for that. However, maybe you just didn't get all the toys you wanted when you were a kid, and so you had to suffer not quite so many toys. Okay, I get it. That's unpleasant, but that's not really the same sort of thing. Yeah. But the problem is, then a man says, "Here's this advice. Well, I'll go to a therapist for that." Well, what do you get to the therapist? The therapy process is essentially a maternal style process. It's nurturing. It's warm. It invites in. It's gentle. But here's the reality. A man who's dealing with what I call a lowercase d trauma, that's not what he needs. He needs a kick in the butt. Men respond to challenge. There's something innate in a man where if you go up to a man and you say, hey, I bet you can't even do this. What do you think? Oh, we respond to that. We lean in. We as men need a kick in the butt. And look, I know stuff happens. We have disappointments. We all have stuff that goes wrong. But part of being a man means I got to take responsibility and say, look, I probably didn't show up that great. Yeah, there was other stuff that was bad. I was unlucky stuff too. But what can I do? Where can I step up and really lean into this as a challenge? And that's where I think a lot of people get stuck in this trauma therapy cycle is they don't, especially as men, get that challenge they need to get themselves moving in the right direction. What if they don't recognize the, the challenge? You know, I mean, is at least going to somebody else, a third party, like you're mentioning, a way to focus them there? I mean, I'm, I'm sure I think there's a lot of people that just don't understand their own problems. Oh, most people don't. Uh, no one does. I don't either. Like, that's why I have a coach myself. Um, no one can see it. Like, imagine trying to, like, you know, shave the back of your head with trying to use some system of mirrors. It doesn't work very well, right? You need someone else to go with an outside perspective and say, hey, here's what I see is going on. But on top of that, we live in a really nasty situation where men are told don't have feelings. And so what do we do? We have to hide them. There's two feelings men are allowed to have, anger and lust. Those are the only two allowed. And by the way, those aren't good ones. Those are what we should traditionally call vices. But you look at Indiana Jones, he's like the, the epitome. He has them both. And so we men were afraid to even look. It's like not only can we not see you know, the back of our head, we've got blinders on, intentional blinders. And so, yeah, we do need someone else to see what's, what's going on. Have you ever worked with any men? So you, you talk, you know, it's, I think it's, there's half of that is true, personally. You know, that we can disagree here that that is, uh, men aren't allowed to have feelings. I don't know. There's a big emasculation push, push in society right now also, where, where men are, true. okay, we're supposed to do this thing. But the problem with that that I've that I've heard from other men, and I've experienced this too as, as well, is like when you open up to let's say a woman, maybe you're intimate with from a girlfriend level or or a wife or something like that, and then you you start to let those feelings out, and then those feelings get used against you, right? Um, I, it, have you ever worked with any men that have experienced that, and then the, then maybe they're gun shy about reopening up in that way? Absolutely. Let me clarify. Let me like qualify one other statement a little bit. Men aren't allowed to have masculine style feelings. We're totally the world's encouraged to have feminine style feelings. Yeah. But my claim to you is those are very, very different things. Men and women experience the world differently. Our brains are wired differently. Our home hormones are different. Even the way we experience and process emotions is fundamentally different and radically so. And so you're right. You have the world comes down and tries to mask it a man. He just vomits his feelings out of his girlfriend. She for sure is going to use him against him. Why? Because mm -hmm. he's violated the nature of what he is. Men are called to be masculine, to be the rock, to be order, to be structure, foundation. And if you violate that nature, you then put you're a woman, whoever that, whatever capacity that is, into a really horrible spot where she doesn't know what to do. And so, yeah, but if a man has these feelings that, like, let's say to you right now, and I said to you, Lance, I'm just completely losing it. I've got I have no idea what I'm doing. Every piece of my life is in a pooper. I can say that to another man. 
but I would actually be wrong to say that's my wife. And the reason why it breaks the fundamental nature of the masculine feminine relationship. And then she's going to respond poorly to that. What I can express to her is I can express to her say, you know, I'm, I'm worried right now, this particular thing with the children is concerning me. Here's my plan. Here, I'd like to talk to you about the plan, I'd like your input, but this is a fear I have about this, but I know we're going to solve it. And then you can still have a feeling and express it in a way that doesn't violate the fundamental nature of masculinity. Yeah, I think thank you for unpacking that. That that's exactly what I was hoping to to, to, un, to understand a little bit further was just the deeper dive into that because it's true. I mean, you're saying, and the way I know about it is my only personal experience. But then there's there's literally all these memes and reels on Instagram and TikTok and all the other places that are actually explaining this this whole this whole problem, this dynamic, for sure. Men are in a catch twenty two right now. Um, it's it's a it's a problem. So you know, I'm glad there's people out there like you that are helping men kind of navigate this strange modern era that we're in um as far as men goes which kind of brings me to my next question is how do you think the christian faith combines with modern psychology and coaching uh my answer to that is in a short word perfectly and the reason why i say this is the christian faith is really a study of psychology as well what is the bible you know it's a, it's if you really burn down to the core of it it's a series of instructions about how human interactions work what do you as a human being need to thrive to better yourself, become more holy, which we call what holy means, become a better version of yourself. And, and you look at that journey, and I often say today, psychologists are rediscovering truths that Christians knew long ago. Now, that said, throughout the history of the church, many have made grievous errors and radically overstepped the authority, which which they've been allowed to speak and, and given Christianity and Christendom as a whole a bad name in that sense. But the core tenets of what the Bible teaches, what the tradition of the church holds, align perfectly. And in fact, I'd argue, actually fully unlock the psychology benefit. So many modern coaches, so many modern therapists, they're forced to appeal to a greater power. They're forced to appeal to some force outside of yourself. The universe wants this, whatever. And when we move from an abstract greater power in the external to a particular greater power that is a personal relationship, that actually even deepens and makes more powerful the psychological truths. Amazing. What is uh, the next sort of modern question I have here is like, well, okay, then then if if men are you know relying on if they're looking back to their faith to look forward again in, in the modern world, how 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 do you propose men respond to you know unique challenges of living then a Christian life in the modern world? Which is, I, we probably both agree. Like, oh, we sure. are we're we're in a we're in a secular society and, and it's an experiment, right? If, if it's a very small blip actually on the timeline of humanity, so how how do men do it? I mean, it's a challenge. You know, earlier you said men are in a catch twenty two, and I totally agree. But there's a way outside some of that catch twenty two, and that way out is to be willing to be uncomfortable. And so many of us are so terrified of discomfort. You know, this this chair I'm sitting in, oh, it doesn't have enough cushion. I've got another one. Oh, it's a little warm. I better have a cold beer. Like, we're so terrified of this discomfort that because of that, we end up trapping ourselves. But as a Christian in the modern world, what we really need to understand is we live in a post-Christian world, but the truth is still the truth. And it may be uncomfortable to go out there and embrace things the way that we know we need to embrace them, but it's far better than the alternative. And there's a piece, I sometimes use this metaphor, that inside of every man lives a little piece of ourselves, a little man inside of us. And if we lie, if we if we cheat, if we aren't authentic, that little man gets crunched down, he hunches over, he gets smaller. And that's symbolic of our own emotional self. And as we become dis uh, disintegrated, then we kind of like just, uh, we don't thrive. And maybe we're getting along, maybe we're comfort, maybe we have an extra beer that night to numb the pain, but we're not living a life of fullness. And the contrast is, if you're willing to be bold, to take that risk, to be uncomfortable in a moment, you can actually go on with your shoulders back. The little man inside you stands tall and proud. And maybe, you know, it's not, then maybe your life isn't perfect because there's other external oppression, but you are so much happier and more fulfilled as a man. Yeah, yeah. Step up to the challenge. Like you said, be uncomfortable. Um, I, I think that's, for me as an entrepreneur, that's one of the things I really mean, just tried to, I, I've been better at explaining lately is I'm like, if you're going to be in, if you're going to be in the business world as a man, and take the risks, then you better get really good at being comfortable with the uncomfortable. You kind of mentioned also some of the addictions, right? Of like, oh, I can't, I had a hard day and to cope with the hard day and we're human. So it's, it's, it's a difficult life, right? We're resisting gravity every day. I mean, Jordan Peterson puts it pretty well of like, oh, it's every day is like a struggle. Like you're, you're resisting gravity. So how do you help coach men to break free from some addictions like that, right? Where they do fall into lust or alcohol or anything. I think the first thing we have to do is get crystal clear on what the addiction is really costing us. It's very, very easy to put the blinders on and be like, it's fine. Maybe have an extra beer, an extra five, whatever, six pack, whatever, every night. It's fine. I'm still functioning. I'm still getting my life. 
we don't see the cost. We hide the cost from ourselves. When we get crystal clear on what the cost is, now we actually have motivational change. But number two, we need to understand what's going on underneath that. No one ever comes home and says, you know, I would like a blase life where I'm just kind of bored and just barely get by, unfulfilled, unpassionate, and honestly, horrible. Who wants that? that? Nobody wants that. We don't head off there intentionally. We stumble there because we're afraid to confront the discomfort that's required to get somewhere else. You know, I recently watched a video of yours. It was a really cute video where you were doing the fishing uh, cook competition, pull the fish out and then kind of cook it and see it oh, in yeah. two minutes or whatever. <laughs> and I was watching that. You two are there. You're like super uncomfortable, right? You're in an awkward position. You're trying to fillet the fish at a funny angle. I mean, I filleted fish tons of times. So that was a fast fillet, by the way, dude. And then you get it in there and you're even so eating it while it's still hot. You're uncomfortable. Yeah. But do you see the joy in the video? video on both you and your friend's face as it just lights up with we did it and it's like the man who struggles and contends and goes forth in the battlefield takes a few wounds but at the end of it he's alive and vibrant that is so worth so much discomfort and so many little wounds along the way yeah agreed i know i was uh, hiking with my daughter last summer um and it was one of the hardest hikes she's ever been on i mean it was really if anybody's watching youtube I'm, my hand is holding up it's like a 45 degree angle and uh, I was just enjoying myself. It was raining on us. It was very steep. It, I was sweating like crazy. And then I, I, I'm I, way ahead of her, right? But I can see her down the hill. And I lean back against a rock. It's a very start, steep, steep, steep cliff. And I'm breathing super hard and I'm sweating and I'm dirty, and disgusting and all that. But I had this giant smile on my face. And she comes up. She was miserable. And she was like, why are you happy? And I'm like, can't you feel that? And she goes, what do you mean? I'm like, we, I'm alive. Like, I know I'm alive right now. Like uh, by Amen. every, every freaking fiber, you know what I mean? Like the rain is coming down and all that. Yeah. I, I wish it's so interesting, like living in this, again, back to this modern society and like all the comforts and now, but then you're seeing people go out and seek like uncomfort. I, there are some like white pills and that sort of, you know, those kind of looks that we're seeing people like do like where they're doing the ice plunges and stuff like that. Um, how do you like what how do you challenge your your people you work with to go out there and get uncomfortable? I mean, are there very specific things that you're trying to help them suggest that they do? So general discomfort is always a great thing. Like ice plunges are awesome. But what I find is far more helpful is most of us have some major problem in our life. And most of us have when that major problem, there's some major discomfort that will help. Let's imagine you're having some struggles with your wife. All right. Here's a challenge to every man. I can give this one right now. It's real fast. If you're struggling with your wife, the next time your wife comes up to you and she has a big load of words, because that's what women do. And those words might even contain your name. I want to challenge you to allow the discomfort of her words to pass over you without letting it be about you. This is really hard, actually. But here's my statement. And this is a practical, this is a tool that's not like an absolute scientific statement. It's a tool. Act as if the words she's saying have nothing at all to do with you, even if your name's in them, nothing to do with you, and have only to do with a feeling that she's feeling. And if you are willing to endure that discomfort, because it's painful as a man to feel that wave of big negative words that's just mm -hmm. flying out of your wife's mouth and smacking you in the face, right? But to sit there and endure it and choose to believe, nope, this isn't actually about me. She just has a feeling that's that bad. That's where my wife's at. She has this horrible feeling. This is the one I love. She has this horrible feeling. No matter what the words are, that's a discomfort that if you're willing to embrace it, will transform your marriage. And so there's plenty of discomfort right at hand. Anywhere that you are struggling, odds are very high. It's because there's a discomfort right there that you're refusing to endure. Yeah. You 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 started one of the things we started talking about right away in this interview was that uh, the routine in the morning and then how you were balance you were trying to balance uh you know when you prayer versus then when all the kids started waking up what other strategies are you are you helping people out with is specifically men to balance the obligations of their work and family you know we have a a really uh, proclivity to like being workaholics, uh, we do men. It just is what it is. Um, you know, it's part of the, part of the deal. So like, you know, what kind of tools are you helping people equip people with? So I work with a lot of very highly successful men, very, you know, driven type A personalities. And here's the problem is they have what I call a performance based identity. Oftentimes I'll ask men, who are you? Oh, I'm so-and-so. Okay, great. But deeper down, who are you? What are you? What is this you know, bundle of bones and skin I'm talking to here? What does it actually mean? And so often I get an answer that boils down to, I am the good things I produce. And when we have that mentality and our culture is soaked in that mentality, like if you're on a soccer team and you're at the final moments, you got the ball, you're in front of the goal, you swing your leg back, everything hinges. Does your toe hit it straight or do you hit it off sideways? Do you win the goal, become the champion of the year, or do you miss it, go home in shame with all by yourself? 
Like we see this in our culture, but it's not who we are fundamentally. And we need to have a deeper connection going back to being a human being rather than a human doing. And when we can start to make that switch internally, the work stuff falls apart. And there's a lot of secular tools people talk about, like write your own epitaph for your own funeral. Okay, that's cool. It's great to exercise. It can oftentimes show you something, but there's something deeper there. There's a deeper component. And again, we talked about this earlier, connecting with that higher power, with God, with whatever you want to call it, to, to see who you are, your identity and a light and a perspective that's bigger than this moment and this corridor and this deliverable for this objective. And when we can do that, the work stuff starts to get a whole lot better. Yeah. What role do you think uh, emotion, empathy, and compassion play in a man's life? It, it, and, and before you answer the question, I, I want to like, dude, on the surface, that might sound like some of these feminine traits that we talked about earlier, right? But I'm not sure that that it does. I would love to hear, um, you know, how, how does that relate to a man's life? Because a lot of people can get it confused in that kind of way. Oh, very much so. And again, there's a very different between a masculine way of expressing these essential traits versus a feminine way. And, and let me be really blunt. Women in general are way better at this in expressing their own way than we men are. We, there's a lot of reasons why it doesn't matter. So what does it look like for a man to be empathetic? For a man to be empathetic is, I'm going to use an example I just used a second ago, when your wife is upset and angry and she's yelling at you. For a man to be empathetic means to be solid enough, a rock, that she can have all those emotions and you can choose to love her and see that pain and feel that pain under all that anger. And when you can do that, when you can empathize with that pain and say, honey, I feel the pain you're in right now and I want it to be better. And I'm so sorry for whatever I did that contributed towards you feeling this way. When we can empathize and connect on that level, that's a game changer. Um, the same thing with men having emotions. We have emotions. They're different. They're slower. They're, they're generally not as explosive, but they're still extremely powerful. They have to be processed. I oftentimes use the analogy. If you take all your emotions, shove them in the trash compactor. I had a buddy with a trash compactor who never wanted to empty. That was disgusting what happened under his counters. None of us want to do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I actually think – so I, I think for me, one of the things that uh, as a man is it, that gets – I had to clarify for myself was the difference between empathy and sympathy. And I, I agree with you. Women, women, women seem like they're for sure better at being sympathetic, empathetic. I, I think you could make a different argument for that. And I'm not trying to argue with you or anything yeah. just, just to paint for the audience is like, once you understand the difference between those two, then, and if you, and, and sympathy is like, I feel sorry for somebody. Oh, I'm going to soothe you. But empathy is just understanding them. And then holding strong, like you said, too, and, and not getting pulled emotionally in, in any regard. You're just leveling with that person, whether it's your wife or a coworker or a subcontractor or, or all these things. When you understand that, like empathy is actually very powerful. Like I, I think it's actually – it can be even a more masculine trait because you're Absolutely. just stoic and, and in control of the situation at that point, right, by understanding other people. Um there's two questions I ask every every guest at the end of the show here, Michael. And the first one is knowing what you know now, and if you go back in time when you first started, what you do with men um, and coaching them, what is one piece of advice you'd give yourself? I think the biggest piece of advice I'd give myself is to challenge harder. Early on, I was afraid to challenge too much. I, I was like, you know, I don't want to beat him up. And now I find that within proper restraint, the more I push a man, the more he responds, the more that we lean in together to say, here's what's going on underneath. That is a game changer. I think the other thing I tell myself is to not be so scared that I'm the wrong person. This goes back to my faith. You know, there's, an, there's a saying in the faith that God doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called. And as a man of faith, I think I really doubted that this was, I have a PhD in science and chemistry. Why am I going to be a life coach? Like, what, why would I be called to this in the first place? And so there's a lot of doubt there. And I think looking back, I realized that I allowed that to sabotage how I project, how I presented myself, how I encountered men and, and most of my business model. And so I'd say that too. I love that. Do you know, is, is that a specific verse that... It's not a specific verse. Um, it's a summation of several different verses. And you can look at the story of Jonah. You kind of see the same thing. Like he's woefully ill-equipped to go to Nineveh, yeah. right? And, but God equips him with what he needs to create the massive transformation. David, woefully ill-equipped to conquer Goliath, right? Like he has five little stones and a sling. And this dude's like seven, eight foot tall and weighs like 300 pounds of muscle. What's this little scrapper going to do? But God equips him in the right way to bring success. Yeah, I love that so much. I'm actually going to text that to my friend who is this huge prepper. And he's fully equipped if you catch my drift. <laughs> and I and I, and I'm like I'm like not I'm like not like I'm a, I support all that they're doing you know and all of that kind of thing. But I go like I don't know man, like what if I just have faith? 
and therefore, like, if I if I ever got I'm unequipped and I get called, so I don't know. I'm just teasing with that. So I really appreciate that, Michael. That was that was pretty brilliant. You totally should. You totally should. Since <laughs> I might know who that friend is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Well, last question here is where where can people find and follow you if they want to get in touch about your services? Absolutely. So I'm an engineer. I have like no marketing creative genius whatsoever. No name making. I'm a life coach. I'm Catholic. I work with Christians generally. I'm a work with men. I'm a Catholic life coach for men. Type that in. You'll find my podcast, my website. Throw the .com is my website. It's all there is to me. Catholic Beautiful. life coach for men. Beautiful. Michael, thank you so much for being on the show today. You're a wonderful guest. Lance, it's been a delight.